blood and circulatory system disorders. And um, this is just an introduction. The cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system, heart and blood vessels and so on. Um, this is generally speaking, what are the types of blood vessels? We have arteries, veins, capillaries. Uh, we have systemic circulation and pulmonary circulation. Um, are you guys familiar with these terms? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between each one of those? Um, of course, the systemic circulation is between the heart and the rest of the body, except the lung. And the pulmonary circulation is between the heart and the lung. Uh, the capillaries are one cell layer. A single endothelial layer. This is for the capillaries. Other than that, they have different, like here, they have different layers. There was a model in the AMP that's showing the difference between veins and arteries, but this is just three layers in both arteries and veins. The capillaries are one single endothelial layer. Now the, the blood in general consists of two parts. The fluid part which is called the plasma part, the plasma, and the formed elements, or the cellular elements. The different cells are called erythrocytes. What are erythrocytes? What's the common name? Red blood, blood cells, leukocytes, and thrombocytes, which is this, right? And the plasma is a fluid part that contains plasma proteins. Um, here are the cells, you have leukocytes, you have erythrocytes, thrombocytes. Just leukocytes, and there was actually uh, a model like this showing you granulocytes, agranulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. These are uh, the different types of white blood cells, okay? Neutrophils, eosinophils, ba uh, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. Um, Neutrophils and monocytes they are responsible for phagocytosis. Eat, eating anything that's not needed. Neutrophils are the small ones and monocytes are the big ones. So these are called the micro and this is called the macrophage. Eosinophils, this is important for allergic reaction. Basophil is for inflammation and lymphocytes are for specific immunity. This is just generally speaking, this is hemopoiesis going step by step until you generate the cells. These are the normal red blood cells. And the normal red blood cells looks like this. If you see it's biconcave. Here is one side and the other side is the same thing. Biconcave. And it does not have a nucleus and it does have hemoglobin. Okay? Are we following so far? Red blood cells contain hemoglobin. What's the hemoglobin? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Hemo and globin. Globin is a protein. Hemo is a part that contains the iron. So hemoglobin. This is the contents of the red blood cells. The lifespan of the red blood cells is 120 days, which is about four months. After which, apoptosis. It's going to die. We talked about apoptosis. And when it dies, we are not going to get rid of it. When it dies, it's going to break down. And the contents, which is hemoglobin, is a globin part, which is protein, that's going to go back to the bone marrow to be recycled, because it's protein, it's important, it's good. How about the heme part? And this will be an introduction for the next part, so let's understand it. Here is a red blood cell that's aged, 120 days. That's it, it's not going to do the job anymore. What should we do now? Send it to the spleen or liver, phagocytosis are going to take it and break it down. And then what? You have hemoglobin, hemoglobin, globin is a protein, recycle. Send it back to the bone marrow to reuse it for generating other red blood cells. How about the heme part? This is the part that contains the iron. The iron is important. So we're going to take that iron back to the bone marrow. How about the remnants? The remnant is called bilirubin. And bilirubin is something that we need to get rid of. Are we okay so far? Okay, so the remaining part of the heme, not the iron, the iron is good. Recycle it. 
send it back to the bone marrow to reuse it. But the rest is going to become something called bilirubin. And bilirubin is something that's yellow in color. If it increases in the blood, <coughs> what do you call this situation? If bilirubin, which is yellow in color, increase in the blood. Jaundice. We call it jaundice. Okay? <coughs> there is a hormone that's important that's secreted from the kidney, which is called erythropoietin, and this is something important to know. Erythropoietin is a hormone secreted from the kidney to stimulate the bone marrow to make red blood cells. Erythropoietin. And erythro means? Red. Red, which is red blood cells. Poietin is the same as gen, generator. So poietin means to make something. So erythropoietin is something that's important to know. Let's see. And here is what I just talked about. Red blood cells, they are going to be hemolyzed. What's lysis mean? A suffix that means what? Lysis. Break down. Yes. So hemolysis, break down the red blood cells. Okay? Hemoglobin will become heme and globin. Globin, recycled. Heme, iron part, recycle. Remnants, bilirubin. <coughs> bilirubin. And bilirubin is yellow in color. Right? This bilirubin will go to the blood, will go to the liver, and the liver is going to do something called conjugation. It's going to add something to it to be soluble in the blood, basically. And then it will be secreted in the bile, and you lose it in the stool. But part of it is going to be recycled. Hemostasis. Hemo means bleeding or blood. Stasis means to stop. So hemostasis is how we stop the bleeding. If you are bleeding, how to stop it? It usually goes in three steps. Number one, the blood vessels constrict. Okay? Number two, platelets come and seal temporarily the injured part. And then the coagulation is going to occur. Okay? And I, I would call it like this. What, what do you think or what would you do if you have one of your water pipes in your house broken down? What comes to your mind? You don't, you don't want to ruin the furniture, right? So you shut down the water. Isn't that the first thing to come to your mind? Somebody shut down the water, right? And you can get something, a piece of cloth or something, and temporarily close it so you don't ruin the furniture. And then you can call the plumber to fix it, right? You don't like leave it leaking like this and call the plumber, right? The whole house will be flooded. This is exactly the same. So the first thing is vasoconstriction. You constrict the blood vessels so that less blood come and then plate, uh, platelet cloth, the platelets seal temporarily, temporarily seal, like you put something on the water pipe. And then coagulation mechanism followed by fixing the problem, which is the, the, the plumber part. And then the blood clot will be removed when your skin get back to normal by something called plasmy. Now vitamin K is an important vitamin for this process that we need to know. Vitamin K. Vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin. Okay? The liver needed, the liver needs this vitamin K in order to make prothrombin. Prothrombin is, will become thrombin, and thrombin is going to activate fibrinogen to fibrin, and fibrin is what makes the blood clot. One more time. It is the liver, okay? And the liver is going to make prothrombin. Okay? In order to make prothrombin, you, need, you may need vitamin K. <coughs> is this part clear? In order to make prothrombin, you need vitamin K. Prothrombin will become thrombin. And thrombin is going to activate fibrinogen to fibrin. And this fibrin will make blood clots. 
It's basically fibers that make the blood clot. So what's the importance of vitamin K used by the liver to make prothrombin? Okay. Here is a hemostasis. Um, the details is not the most important. Just know that this is a process of, of coagulation, how to occur. Calcium is needed for coagulation. Vitamin K, we talked about it. And here is what I just talked about. Prothrombin to thrombin, fibrinogen to fibrin, and that will make a blood clot. Okay? Um, heparin, and warfarin, this is one thing that I want you to know. Heparin and warfarin, these are against blood clotting. They stop blood clotting. If you know somebody having a surgery or something and they are um, afraid of having blood clots, they give them heparin or warfarin for some time. So heparin and warfarin are against repeated blood clots. Okay? They prevent the blood clot. And this is that's something that's important to know. Okay? I'm being specific here. Are we following? This is what you have to know. This is how the process goes of coagulation. Most importantly, prothrombin to thrombin, which need vitamin K for thrombin, fibrinogen, fibrin, and then you make blood clots. So this part is important. And heparin and warfarin, also known as comedine, these are going to stop further blood clots. Blood typing, this is A and P. Are you guys familiar with A, B, A, B, and O? Which one is a universal donor? Oh, oh. oh which one is a universal recipient? Maybe. Why O is a universal donor? Like Lacking A and B, what? <laughs> Antigens. How about why A, B is a, a universal recipient? It's lacking A and B, what? Antigens? Antibodies. Okay? Okay. These are the different types, and I think you're familiar with that. We don't have to repeat. Now, if you are uh, doing a blood count, you're counting the blood cells. It can be complete blood count. Tell me in general how many white blood cells do you have. This is called complete blood count. And it can be differential. Differential means you don't only tell me how much white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, that's not enough. You tell me specifics about the white blood cells. Don't tell me white blood cells are 20,000. That's, that's complete blood count. But you need to tell me how many eosinophils, how many basophils, how many neutrophils. So you need to be specific here. Okay? I talked about this here. Do you remember this? When I gave you penia versus cytosis, so you were familiar with that? Are we familiar with that part? Okay, so I don't have to repeat it. So we know that leukopenia is decreased, right? And what's the problem with having decreased leukocytes? <coughs> you can't find infection. Cannot find infection. You cannot fight infection, so you're more exposed to infection. Okay, there is one term here that I didn't mention, but you have to know it, which is not erythro, not erythropenia alone, not leukopenia alone, not thrombocytopenia alone, it's all of them combined, and you call that pan cytopenia. Pan. What's pan? Means everything, collectively. Did you get what the pan cytopenia means? Pan means all of it. Thrombocytes, platelets, white blood cells, red blood cells, everything. Everything. Okay? And pancytopenia, when you don't make all or reduce everything, all lines, all three lines are going to be reduced. And this usually occurs with bone marrow suppression. Do you guys remember what's the effect of the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy that we talked about? It suppresses the bone marrow, right? When you suppress the bone marrow, you have all three lines suppressed, right? So you have thrombocytopenia, you have leukopenia, you have erythropenia, right? We have all three. What do you call all those three combined? Pancytopenia. 
So when do you get pancytopenia? Bone marrow suppression. Anything that suppresses the whole bone marrow, you get pancytopenia. The opposite is increased, which is cytosis. Uh, one thing here that's uh, specific is if you have eosinophils, it means you have allergic reaction. It was in the previous chapter. If you have more eosinophils, it means you have allergic reaction. If you have more neutrophils, it means you have bacterial <laughs> infection. Now if you look at the cells, you look at the morphology first. Morphology means how does it look like, okay? So we're talking about the size and the shape and so on. Now there is a specific test that's called the hematocrit. Here is the thing. Let me just explain why or what, what's, what's the meaning of hematocrit. Let's say, for example, I have 5 million red blood cells. Okay? And you have 6 million red blood cells. It means you have more blood than me. So you're better than me, right? This is false. Why? Because maybe you have 6 million and they are very small. And I have 5 million that's big. So I, I can do better function than you, right? So obviously, the number is not alone. Here they discovered hematocrit. They said it's not just about the number. It's not just about the size. It is we can get a collective term to know exactly what's the condition by hematocrit. And hematocrit is the percentage of the cells compared to the fluid part. And this is exactly, it's very simple. Here's how they do it. Give me a blood sample, I take a blood sample, and I put it in a test tube like this, okay? You put it in a centrifuge and leave it for some time, and you will see the following happen. You see the cells sedimenting, settling down at the bottom, and the fluid part will be on top, <coughs> which is the plasma part. This is, going to, this is exactly what's going to happen if I leave it for some time, all right? So now, let's say this is 10. And this is 4. Can you tell me the ratio this to the all? This is 4 and the whole is 10. 4 to 10 is what's the percentage? 40%. 40 hematocrit. This is hematocrit. What's the percentage of this to the whole thing? It's 40% in this case. If, if it comes to 3 or something, it's 30%, which is not good. Okay, if it goes up, 50, 60, it's above normal, and so on. Okay, so this is why this is better, because maybe this number is big, and the cells are small. Maybe this number is small, but the cells are big. So it doesn't matter. I will know the content, which is the hemoglobin, which is the most important. Did you understand the hematocrit? This is the hematocrit, which is more accurate. They can also measure the hemoglobin directly in different ways. But hematocrit is the most accurate because it tells me exactly the ratio. If you have 40%, it's 40%, irrespective number and shape and so on. If you're having a problem, we can do something called reticulocytic count. Or reticulocytic reticulocytes, these are immature red blood cells, immature. When you make, I didn't, I didn't talk much about the development of the red blood cells, it's not the most important. That's why I didn't talk much about it. But on the way, on your way to make the mature red blood cells, you make something called reticulocytes. And what's the importance of that? If you make reticulocytes a lot, it means the bone marrow is overworking because it started to showing you the immature cells. <coughs> Maybe a tumor or something. Chemical analysis, you can check and see what the amount of vitamin B12, folic acid, which is needed. You can tell how much iron do you have, and so on, which are what, all the things that are needed to make the blood. Bleeding time, prothrombin and partial thromboplastin, this is very important to know. And it's, at the, and it's measuring different things. You have to know this, okay? What's a bleeding time? Bleeding time is, you have a puncture, you have a wound. How long does it take to stop bleeding? This is bleeding time. And this is basically measuring the function of the platelets. Do you have enough platelets or not? Are the platelets working good or not? 
bleeding time. Prothrombin and partial thromboplastin, which is PT and PTT, this is measuring the coagulation part. Do you remember when I mentioned how do we stop bleeding in the beginning? You do vasoconstriction first, right? And then temporary seal of the platelets, and then the coagulation process, right? In order to measure the function, bleeding time will tell you exactly what's happening to the platelets. Is it good or bad? Prothrombin time and partial thromboplastin time, this is more to measure the coagulation. So if you have a problem with the coagulation, you'll have a problem with those two. If you have a problem with the platelets, you'll have a problem with this. Okay? Blood therapies, not the most important. I can give you whatever you need. You need red blood cells, you give red blood cells. You need white, I give you white. Uh, sometimes I can give you plasma, sometimes I give you artificial. So it depends. Epoitin alpha, this is erythropoietin. What's erythropoietin? A hormone <coughs> that does what? Erythropoietin. Blood cell formation. And where do we secrete it from? From the kidney. Yes. So this is a hormone secreted from the kidney to stimulate the red blood cell formation, stimulate the bone marrow, to make more red blood cells. So this can be a treatment. Sometimes you need a bone marrow transplant, sometimes drugs, and so on. Now abnormalities. The first abnormality that we need to know is anemia. And anemia, we used to, we used to say that anemia is low red blood cell count. It came out <coughs> now that it's not accurate. This is not right. We used to, when we hear anemia, uh, you don't have enough red blood cells, right? It goes like this. No. It's not only about the number. So anemia is you don't have hemoglobin. Whether it's because of the number or because of the size, something else, right? So it's all about hemoglobin. When you say anemia, I will tell not red blood cells in general, not the number. I have anemia, I will tell you right away, you have a problem with your hemoglobin. Okay? So the problem is hemoglobin, so you cannot carry the needed oxygen. This is basically what it is. And if you don't carry enough oxygen, what's going to happen, which is something that you will still need to know, First of all, if you don't have enough oxygen, the cells will not get enough oxygen and your metabolic processes are going to be affected. That's number one. Number two, you will compensate for that because you don't have enough oxygen, so you have tachycardia, your heart is going to speed up to help you, and you'll have the signs of anemia. What are the signs of anemia that you need to know? How to know that this person is having anemia or not? He will be pale, fatigued, having dyspnea and tachycardia. And this is something that you need to know how to tell. I look at you, you look pale to me. You look pale, you don't look good. You look pale to me. Uh, and uh, I'm always fatigued. I, I don't have energy, okay? I'm always fatigued. Um, I always have a problem breathing. I go like this, I don't breathe normal. I have dyspnea, difficulty breathing. And my heart is always racing. So these are the general signs that can tell me that you're having anemia. The problem with the oxygen is, which cells specifically are the first cells to be affected with lack of oxygen or low oxygen? It's a rapidly growing cells, right? If you're growing, if the cells are growing, all cells need oxygen, right? All cells need oxygen. If you're rapidly growing cells, you need more oxygen to grow faster, right? Make sense? So if you don't have enough oxygen, your cells that are rapidly growing are going to be the first one and the worst to be affected. Mainly, epithelial cells. Where are the epithelial cells? Epithelial cells take it as a rule, generally speaking. This is the covering and the lining of the body. Covering and lining. Covering from outside, lining from inside. This is epithelial cells. Did we get the idea? So where is your epithelial cells? Anything that's covering or lining. Covering is like your skin, covering from outside, right? Lining is like the lining of your digestive tract, for example. 
lining or covering. So what happens if you don't have enough oxygen? Your epithelial cells, which are rapidly growing, trying to get oxygen, and you don't have enough. So they are going to die a little bit. Some of them are going to die. Making some problems. Digestive tract will be inflamed, ulceration, meaning you lose some cells because you don't have enough oxygen. You will have some sort of inflammation. Uh, the hair will start to fall down a little bit. Okay, be all of this because these rapidly growing cells are not getting the enough oxygen that they need. And this is the problem with the anemia. If it goes more than that, you can get the heart problems. But generally speaking, number one problem with deficiency of oxygen is rapidly growing cells, namely epithelial cells in here. Now the different types of anemia that we need to know. The first type of anemia is iron deficiency anemia. Generally speaking, in order to make red blood cells, in order to make red blood cells, what's the content of red blood cells? Hemo, hemoglobin, right? What's inside the red blood cells? Hemoglobin. Okay. Globin is protein. <coughs> Heme is iron plus other things. If you don't, so you need protein. You need iron. And in the process of forming this, you need vitamin B12 and folic acid. This is not the only thing. These are the main things. Okay? So this is just an introduction of different types of anemia. How can I make my red blood cells? You need amino acids, proteins, to make the globin part. I need iron to make the heme. I need vitamin B12 and folic acid to help the reactions to make the hemoglobin. Did you get this part? So if, you, if you're lacking any one of those, you cannot make your red blood cells and you have anemia. This is the first thing that we need to know. Is that clear enough? What do you need to make blood, red blood cells? In order to make blood cells, you need proteins, iron, vitamin B12, folic acid. This is not the only thing. This is the most important. Lack of any one of those will mean anemia. All right, so far? Okay, the first type is you don't have iron. I call it iron deficiency anemia, and this is the most common one. Okay? And in this part, I want you to know how the cells look like. So this is important. How the red blood cells look like. Okay? Size, from the size, and from the contents. Okay? Size will become here micro. What's micro? Small. So cells will become smaller, right? Instead of being like this, it will be like this, smaller. And hypochromic, chromic means color. So it will be pale colored. Why? Because you don't have enough iron, so you don't have enough, enough hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin is that bright red color. If you don't have enough hemoglobin, you are, the, red, the cells will become pale. It will not become bright red. So in this case, it's called microsthetic hypochromic. In each type of anemia, you need to know the type of cells. Is that clear enough? Okay, so this is the first one. Microsthetic hypochromic. In others, you will see something different. Okay? And again, this is the most common one. Look at the cells here. Too small and too pale. Right? This is very pale. Why would anybody get iron deficiency anemia? The first thing that you come to your mind is you don't eat enough iron. You don't get enough iron in the food, right? Malnutrition. Makes sense. So this is the first thing. There are minimum requirements that you should take of iron. If you don't take it, you have iron deficiency anemia. This is the first one and it makes sense. But chronic blood loss or impaired absorption is something else. How about this? Are you, um, you have anemia, okay, are you getting enough iron? Yes, I am getting more than enough iron, but I still have iron deficiency anemia. Why? Maybe because you don't absorb it. You eat in the food, but you don't absorb, right? Why? Something like impaired absorption, like malabsorption syndromes. You eat enough in the food, you don't absorb, right? Or you eat enough and you absorb and then you lose it. Chronic blood loss. 
if you have a, a little bleeding, let's say, some people actually, it happened. Some people have ulcer in their stomach, and the ulcer is bleeding a little bit, and you don't even know. Because the bleeding is small amount, and it goes and mix with the food, uh, with the stool, so the stool will be a little bit darker, but you don't even know that you're having bleeding. And this can occur for six months, for a year, and you don't know what it is, until you get anemia. So what are the three causes of iron deficiency anemia? Makes sense. It's all common sense. You don't eat it in the diet, or you eat it in the diet and you don't absorb it, or you eat it and absorb it, but you lose it. Chronic blood loss. Are we still following? Are we still okay? All of us. Are we still good? I know it's close to four hours, but we still need to continue, okay? We have to do it. We have to finish. And I want you to get as much as possible because the more you get here, the less effort you make. Okay? And I'm focusing on the most important parts. So you have to know this. Okay? What are the reasons? You don't eat enough in the diet. Or you eat enough but you don't absorb. Or you eat enough and absorb and you chronically lose it, which is chronic blood loss. Okay? Why chronic blood loss will lead to anemia? Because if you're losing blood on a regular basis, you do not recycle your iron, right? Normally, when the, the blood blood cells age, 120 days, you recycle the iron, but if you lose it chronically, you're not recycling the iron, and you would end up having iron deficiency anemia. Is that clear so far? What are the signs or symptoms if you have anemia? You will look pale. You'll be fatigued. Uh, you'll have some menstrual problems, delayed healing, and so on. Okay. Most important to remember is pallor, pallor, and fatigue. Second one is pernicious anemia, which is vitamin B12 deficiency. Look here again. We covered the first one, which is iron. The second one is vitamin B12. <coughs> What's the importance of vitamin B12s? Without details, it's important for the reactions that you do while generating the hemoglobin. That's good enough to know. Okay? This is for vitamin B12. What is the reason for vitamin B12? It's not the same as iron. Okay? Here is the clue. Your need of vitamin, your daily need of vitamin B12 is too small. Enough that's close to be impossible that you have deficiency of vitamin B12 because you don't eat it. If you, even if you eat just a little part of anything green, you get it. The requirements for vitamin B12 is too minimal, too small. So in order to get vitamin B12 deficiency because you're not eating vitamin B12, that's extremely rare. I mean, unless you're starving and not eating anything. But other than that, this is very hard. What's the actual practical reason? You don't absorb it. You eat enough or more than enough, but you don't absorb. Why you don't absorb vitamin B12? Because there is something called intrinsic factor that's secreted from the stomach, and this is the one that's needed for vitamin B12 to be absorbed. You don't have intrinsic factor, you don't absorb vitamin B12. Is that clear? Examples. Uh, I had a surgery to remove part of my stomach, that used to produce the intrinsic factor, I don't produce it anymore, right? Or chronic inflammation. My stomach is always inflamed, so it's not doing the job, giving you intrinsic factor. How to solve this problem? Uh, take more vitamin B12? Is that a good solution? You're not going to absorb it anyway, right? You're not going to absorb it. Take more, take double, 10 times, you're not going to absorb it anymore. It's not about the vitamin B12, it's about absorption, it's about intrinsic factor. So is that a treatment? Of course not. It's not going to help you. How about this? How about I take an intrinsic factor? Artificial intrinsic factor. This is not going to work either. Why? Because if you eat it, you're going to break it down in your stomach, ineffective. It's not going to help you. So what's the only solution now? You take injections of vitamin B12. Bypass the bad part. Okay? Did you get my idea? So you, you cannot eat more. It's not going to help you. You cannot eat intrinsic factor because intrinsic factor is a protein. You're going to digest it. Ineffective. 
So unfortunately, if you know somebody having vitamin B12 deficiency, ask them. They will tell you that we take vitamin B12 injection for life, okay, to bypass the absorption part. So now how the, the cells will look like in this case, remember the first one was microcytic hypochromic, this one is macro, macrocytic, megaloplastic, macrocytic, megaloplastic cells will look bigger, okay? Is that clear enough? So if you ask yourself, uh, cells are big, is that something good? No, they are going to, to die faster. Because bigger cells will go within the capillaries that are very small, you're going to lose it. So, cells are big, but lifespan is short. Did you get this one? So, what are the what, what are the the factors that act, the practical the practical reason? for vitamin B12 deficiency, something in your stomach that interfere with the release of the intrinsic factor. Something like what? Gastritis. Something like what? Like surgery, stomach surgery, okay? So these are things, and, and sometimes even, some people will have antibodies against the cells that make the, 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 the intrinsic factor, right? So it's whatever <laughs> happening in the stomach anyway. It's dietary extremely rare. Okay, so here is, here is your stomach, okay, here are the three factors, this is your stomach, and these are the cells that make the intrinsic factor, okay? You lose these cells, somehow, that's basically what it is. Surgery, you cut this, okay? Inflammation, okay, or, or antibodies against. In all three scenarios, you're losing your cells that make the intrinsic factor anyway. Is that clear enough? So all three factors are related to losing the cells that make intrinsic factor. Okay? The other problem is, if you're having deficiency of vitamin B12, besides having anemia, and what the cells look like in anemia? Small or big, vitamin B12 deficiency anemia which is pernicious anemia. The cells will be bigger, right? Macrocytic megaloplastic. But they're going to, do, to die faster, right? Okay, what else besides the red blood cells? Yeah, the, those, those people will not only have a problem with the red blood cells, they have actually a problem with the nervous system. Because vitamin B12 is not only important for the red blood cells, it's important for the function of the, of the nervous system, okay? So, those people will also have problems with the nervous system. Peripheral nerve specifically, peripheral nerve demyelination. Do you guys remember the myelin sheath? <coughs> in order to make the myelin sheath, in order to make the myelin sheath, you need vitamin B12. You don't have vitamin B12, you can't make the myelin sheath. So you will have some sort of inflammation of, the, of, the, of your nerves, you feel numbness, tingling, stuff like that which is inflammation because of the vitamin B12. So for vitamin B12, which is, uh, uh, which is the pernicious anemia, you don't only have a problem with the red blood cells itself, you also have a problem with your nervous system because vitamin B12 is important for the function of the nervous system. Look at these cells and compare it to the other ones. Does it look bigger, right? People will, with uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, their tongue will be larger and red. These are other signs that show up. They have the digestive tract, they will have problems because of the anemia. Uh, the nervous system, they have some sort of pain or tingling or numbness or so, stuff like that. How to diagnose? Number one, look at the cells. And what are you expecting to see the cells? Bigger, macrocytic, megaloplastic. So this is the first thing. Number two, tell me how much Vitamin B12 do you have in your blood? Blood level of vitamin B12, okay? And then the last one, look at the stomach itself. See if the stomach is good or bad and not secreting. Next type of anemia is called aplastic. Yeah. 
Here are three things that you can write it down if you want to. That will help you. Voices. Plastic. And gem. Any one of those. You see it as a suffix. It means to form. Poises, plastic, gem, any one of those. Suffix equals formation to form. Okay? Trust me, if you collect these suffixes and prefixes, you can solve a lot of questions or you can answer questions even if you don't know what it is. Just by understanding this. Okay? Even if there is a word that you, do, you don't even know. Just put the parts together and it will make sense. Okay, if you know, poise is plastic in general. So, what's A? A prefix A. What does it mean? No. no. What's plastic? Germa generational formation. So, this is anemia of no formation. You don't make it in the first place. You don't make it. Which is obviously something in the bone marrow. Right? So a plastic anemia is a problem in the bone marrow that you don't make the cells in the first place. It's not like you make it and lose it. Or you're having like chronic bleeding or you have iron deficiency or stuff like that. You don't make it in the first place because of the bone marrow itself. So it has to be something that suppresses the bone marrow. Uh, sometimes they say it's idiopathic. You know what idiopathic means? Hmm? Uh, exactly, yes. Unknown cause. They don't know, basically. It just happened. Okay? But there are some reasons. It can be toxins, viruses, or genetic factors, any one of those that, ha that have a problem with the bone marrow. Now, can you tell me in aplastic anemia what kind of deficiency you're going to have? Which, which line of cells? Think about it. The bone marrow is suppressed. What type of cells are you going to lack? Red blood cells. Hmm? Red blood cells. Red blood cells. That's it? White blood cells. That's it? All of them. Bone marrow make everything. Right? So you're losing the three lines. What do you call this condition? Losing the three lines. What starts with what? Pan cytopenia. Pan -cytopenia. And cytopenia. Okay? <laughs> the bone marrow itself is not doing the job. What's the job of the bone marrow? To make all three lines, all of them. The bone marrow make all three lines, red, white platelets. You're not making any one of those. So it's pancytopenia. What's a pancytopenia? Break it down. Anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. Didn't, did you notice that you're seeing this over and over again? I put it here in the beginning, and I told you to, that you're going to see it over and over, right? So this is important to catch up as we go, okay? So here you have anemia, which is um, uh, erythropenia, the same meaning, uh, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. So which type? All of them. Always remember that the bone marrow make everything, everything. It makes all three lines. So here's the question. What will happen if you don't make the red blood cells? You have anemia. And what's the problem with anemia? Pallor, fatigue, and so on. Oxygen, less oxygen go to the cells. What's the problem of, of not making white blood cells? Infection, more infection. What's the problem with not making enough um, uh, thrombocytes or platelets? Bleeding, excessive bleeding. Did you get the idea? This is just a general function. Aplastic anemia. Next type of anemia is hemolytic. Lysis or lytic. Lysis. <coughs> or lytic. Equal breakdown. Here is another suffix. It's good to know. And put together these suffixes and prefixes, it will always make sense. 
So when you put lysis or lytic at the end of any word, meaning breakdown. It's a hemolytic. Means break down the red blood cells, right? So hemolytic anemia is anemia because you're breaking down the red blood cells. You have a problem. Do you make it? Yes. Is the red blood cells normal? Yes, everything is okay. But you break it down for some reason. What is that reason? It can be genetic defect. You have a gene that you lose the cells, you break it down fast. Immune reaction, like you make antibodies against your own cells, right? Any change in the chemistry, something like malaria. Do you know where the malaria lives? If you got infected with malaria, where do they inhibit? Where do they go? Within the red blood cells itself. This is the normal habitat. They live there. So of course, when they live there and they eat it, it's going to rupture. So this is hemolytic. Sometimes toxins, sickle cell anemia is another type, and so on. Now what's the problem with hemolytic anemia? When you break down your blood, blood cells faster. You remember that slide at the beginning when we said you break down the red blood cells, hemoglobin into heme and globin? Globin recycle, and heme you get the iron, and what remains? Bilirubin. So if you have hemolytic anemia, break down the cells faster. You get more bilirubin beyond the capacity of the liver to conjugate and get rid of. So start to accumulate. And what do you call this condition? Jaundice. jaundice. And that explains why do we have jaundice in hemolytic anemia, which is very important to know. Okay? You have jaundice with hemolytic anemia. Why? Because you break down faster, you make more bilirubin beyond the capacity of the liver to conjugate and get rid of, so it starts to accumulate, it looks yellow, giving you the yellow discoloration, which is jaundice. Sickle cell anemia. Sickle means it looks like this. This is a sickle shape. Is that the normal shape of the cells? It's not, right? So it looks like this. Why? It's a problem with the genes. Defect in the genes. And it comes from both parents. And this is an important point to know. Here is a father and mother. And one of them have sickle cell anemia, and the other one does not have it. What happened to, to, the, to their kids? They will have part from here and part from here, right? So this is going to be heterogeneous. Do you guys remember anything about, about that? Do you remember this? The inheritance? If you get one gene from the mom and one gene from that, you always get, get one and one, right? The pairs are come one from here, one from here. If you get one from the mom and the mom is infected, the mom is having the disease and the dad does not have the disease. Do you get the disease? No. You have to have both of them. So the only way to get the sickle cell disease, both parents has to be affected. And you get one from here and one from here. When you have both of them, now you make or you have the sickle cell disease, or sickle cell anemia. How about if you get one and one? Nothing happened? It's not nothing. It's less severe and we call this Sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait. Are we following so far? Don't fall asleep. Are we still following? We will be done soon. Let's just keep concentrating. But did you understand this? Both parents are having the disease. The kids will have the disease. That's it. Sickle cell disease itself. The full blown <coughs> sickle cell disease. But if one is having it and the other one is not having it, the inheritance for the, for the kids will be heterogeneous. One is good and one is bad. So is that completely normal? No, it's not completely normal. You call this sickle cell trait. Heterogeneous, sickle cell trait. And what's the problem with sickle cell trait? It's a different scenario. It's, a, it's more mild. Meaning you do not have a problem as long as you're having enough oxygen. This is if you have sickle cell trait. You don't have a problem. Some, sometimes people have sickle cell trait and you don't, you, they don't even know that they have it. Okay? Why? Because I never have a problem. Right? Unless they go to like, let's say a room like this, but with less oxygen. Or they go in any confined space that they do not have enough oxygen. Now they are going to start to sickle. The cells are going to change and become sickled. And now they have the problem. There is one thing that's weird, but good. 
about the sickle cell trait, people having the sickle cell trait will never have malaria. They, they found out that the red blood cells is bad for malaria. The malaria can come close and then they just leave. Okay? They are protected against malaria. This is something that they found. Okay? Did you understand the sickle cell trait? It's heterogeneous. You don't have the problem unless you have severe hypoxia, severe deficiency of oxygen, and they are protecting against malaria. Okay? So it is, uh, it's um, homozygous recessive. It's recessive. So anything that's recessive, you have to have it from both parents. I don't know if you guys remember that or not, but it's recessive, so you have to have from most more uh, both parents. It's more uh, prevalent in African American population. Just the incidence is more. It can happen to anybody, but it's just more. So here are examples, but if you understand what I just mentioned, that would be good enough. So those people having sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease, it's recessive. So you have to have it from both parents, right? If you have it from the both parents, your hemoglobin will not be normal. You call it hemoglobin S. And S is sickle. Sickle hemoglobin. S. Hemoglobin S. Okay? What's the problem with those people? You will have the sickle cell crisis. Not just the cells will be sickled. You will have a crisis if you have low oxygen. So here I have, just to make sure that you got what I mean, here is I have two, two individuals. One of them is having sickle cell disease, and the other one is having sickle cell trait. And I have severe reduction of oxygen. The, the individual who's having a sickle cell disease will have a crisis. They go to the emergency. The one that's having trait, they just develop sickling. Okay? Did you get the difference? So those will get crises, not just sickling. It's sickled already. So, but they will have crisis, and this crisis will be that these sickle cells look like this. Remember that the normal cells will look like this, so they can pass through the capillaries and the arteries, and they, they are fine. But if, if you look like this, and you're going in the capillaries, you're stuck, and the cells will stuck together, making blood clots, which is a crisis, and you get hypoxia, you get less oxygen to the tissues, and this is called the crisis. Okay? So the, sickle cell, the cells will become will look like sickle shaped, and this will will cause uh, blood clots. The cells will come like this. If this, if can you put like two balls together, soccer balls? Can you can you keep them together? If you push them together, they they will move, right? But if you have it looking like a sickle like this, it's very easy to put them together, right? So cells will come together like this, and it's a blood clot. And actually, this blood clot can go and block the blood supply to any organ, and they can actually die. So if that's the case. Um, they have to be ready for any crisis to occur. If it happens, um, they will need oxygen right away. So here, this is a normal shape, and this is the second ones. Okay. What's the problem with the sickle cells if, if it happened? Number one, I just mentioned that the sickle the cells are going to come together, right, to make a blood clot. Right? Cell with another cell with another cell with another cell. You call this blood clot, right? This blood clot is going to move and block the blood supply for one of the organs, or it's not usually the whole organ, part of the organ, and this part is going to die. And we call this infarction. Infarction. So you can have infarction. This is one. The other thing is these cells are very easy, easy to break down. Right? The normal cells will be like this. These cells are like this. So they go around in the, in, within the capillaries and get stuck, break down, stuck, break down. So when you break it down, when you break down a lot of cells, you get hemolytic anemia. So sickle cell disease is one of the causes of hemolytic anemia. Are we following so far? So what are the consequences or the complications or the problems that can happen? Blood clots leading to infarction and hemolytic anemia. And what happened as a result of hemolytic anemia? What's the level that increase in the blood? Exactly. You get more bilirubin, you get the jaundice. Did you get this idea? So, sickle cell anemia is one of the hemolytic diseases. Okay? And it usually does not appear before 
12, 12 months. So uh, uh, babies who are like six months or something, they don't have the problem. They don't know. Start to appear at the age of one year. When the sickling happen, ischemia of some organs will occur. So these blood clots will block the blood supply to certain organs and you feel pain. So pain is one thing. Because you're losing the blood, you look anemic, so if you feel, you, you will look pale and weak. You have jundice, splenomegaly. Why, why, why people with the hemolytic, not just sickle cell disease, any hemolytic disease, why do they have more Spleen, they have splenomegaly. Why the spleen become larger? Exactly. Because this spleen is where we break down the cells. And you're having more bad cells, so the spleen is overworking. And it will become larger. You have some occlusion and infarction, and that will lead to infarction and death of certain parts. How to diagnose? Simply get the hemoglobin, they put it on a slide, and they put electrical current on both ends, and they, they can examine what type of hemoglobin do you have. What type of hemoglobin do they have? Hemoglobin what? S. They have hemoglobin S. Okay? So if you do this, you know that you have hemoglobin S. Uh, prenatal DNA analysis can be done. So um, uh, I have sickle cell disease, uh, and I want to know if my kids will have sickle, sickle cell disease or not. Do DNA analysis prenatal, okay? Before, not after. So you, you be ready for it. Uh, treatment, you can, you can read it, but not one of those that I mentioned that you need to know. I already told you which one, okay? So this is something they give them some medications just to, to stabilize the red blood cells so you don't break down that fast. They can give some immunization for the kids, they give dietary supplement and so on. <coughs> Sickle cell trait, I just mentioned it, this is only a carrier, he's not affected. He's having one from healthy parent and one from sick parent. So this is a carrier, he's not sick. but. The problem is, he can start having the sickling in case of hypoxia, and they are protected against malaria for some unknown reason. <clears throat> Obviously, the cells are not good enough for malaria to invade. So, let's say, uh, so if somebody that has the trait then um, mates with somebody who has cell cell, then what? It, it, it will be chances now. So, now it's, okay. so it's, it's chances, like 25% may be affected. So I have X and small X, and he's having X and small X. If it happened that you have the X from here and X from there, you get it. If you have one and one, you'll be a carrier. If you have none, you'll be completely fine. This is comparing all these types together, which is just a good uh, revision. Okay, one more thing that I didn't mention that's actually important, this, echlorhydrate. This is something that you also need to remember. Remember vitamin B12, what's the problem with vitamin B12 deficiency or pernicious anemia? Yeah, producing this is for the nervous system, but why do you have vitamin B12 in the first place? It's not dietary deficiency, this is not the main issue. The main issue is, hmm? you because you don't absorb it, yes, why? Because you don't have what? Intrinsic factor, right? Where do you make the intrinsic factor? In the stomach, right? So if you don't make the intrinsic factor in the stomach, you end up getting vitamin B12 deficiency, right? And if, if the stomach is affected, the stomach is not making the intrinsic factor and not making hydrochloric acid either. So it usually happens, A, A means what? What's A? No. Chlorhydra is hydrochloric acid. So those people will also have less hydrochloric acid. It's the same cells, right? I am the stomach, I'm making the intrinsic factor, and I make hydrochloric acid. If I am bad, I don't make intrinsic factor, I don't make hydrochloric acid either, right? The same cells. 
So they usually not only having the pernicious anemia, neurological damage, they also have a chlorhydra. A chlorhydra. Chlorhydra is hydrochloric acid. So if, if you if you get a sample or something, you will see hydrochloric acid, very small amount. Because the same cells that make the intrinsic factor, they make hydrochloric acid. So this is a good comparison, you can go through it, but we, we did all the details already. So, so far we were, were talking about deficiency, lack, deficiency, lack. Now what if you have the opposite? You have too much red blood cells, is that something good? You might think it is good, but it's not. <coughs> okay? The rule of the thumb is, in physiology, or generally speaking, you need everything to be within the normal range. Even if you think it's good. Less is bad, more is bad. I have more red blood cells. This is something good, right? I have red blood cells. This is good. No, it's not good. Okay? Anything that's above or under normal is bad. So what's above? Polycythemia. Poly means a lot, right? Polycythemia have a lot of red blood cells, which is not good. It's a disease. There are two types of polycythemia, primary and secondary. Here is another rule. Any disease, any abnormality. When I say rules, means you apply it for everything. Okay? Any disease can be primary or secondary. Primary means it's happening from the organ itself. Secondary means it's happening somewhere else, reflecting on the organ. So, polycythemia. Primary polycythemia means the problem is in the bone marrow. It makes too much blood, red blood cells. Secondary means the bone marrow is fine. The bone marrow is normal. A problem happening somewhere else that's making the bone marrow make more red blood cells. Do you understand the idea? If I, if I am responsible for something, if I do it more, you call it primary. If I am okay, I'm not doing anything wrong. And you are telling me to do it, it's secondary. Did you get this idea? And this is not only here. Anything, take, take it as general rule. Anytime you see primary and secondary, primary is from the organ itself. Secondary is from somewhere else. So the organ is okay. The other name for primary is polycythemia vera. And this is something that you need to know. So primary polycythemia is high erythrocytes, and the primary one is called vera, okay? And what's the problem with that? The problem is the bone marrow is making more red blood cells itself. It's the problem with the bone marrow, okay? Like bone marrow tumor, for example, neoplasia. You have a tumor in the bone marrow, and the tumor is producing too much red blood cells. This is primary. Secondary is something that's different. Something, secondary, it means the, 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 the bone marrow is fine. The bone marrow is completely normal, okay? If the bone marrow is normal, why are you making red blood cells more? Because something else happening in another spot. Something like hypoxia, for, the, for example. Okay? Uh, if you go to one of the states that have high mountains, if you go to these high mountains, the oxygen tension is less. So now you have a problem. Less oxygen available around you in the atmosphere. So if that's the case, you wanted to make more red blood cells to compensate. Did you have a problem with the bone marrow? No. So is it primary? It is not. You have another problem that's reflecting on it. This is one of the scenarios. What if you have a problem in your kidney and you're making too much erythropoietin, for example? That will be secondary. Okay? But what's the most common cause for primary? Neoplasia. Tumor. Neoplasia. This is for primary. Secondary is something else. Now if you have too much red blood cells, what will happen? Well, if you have too much red blood cells, your blood volume would be higher and you have hypertension, high blood pressure. Isn't that something bad? And that's why I'm saying anything that's above or under normal is bad. It's not just under, even it's above. Hypertension, this is one. Three organs will become bigger. The heart, because it's pumping more blood, the spleen, because it's breaking down more blood, 
uh, lever, which is hepatomegaly, because it's taking <coughs> care of that red bl uh, blood cells extras. And you will have other problems as well, like thrombosis, blood clot, and so on. How to diagnose? Count red blood cells. Uh, hemoglobin, see how is the hemoglobin, hematocrit doing, and examine the bone marrow. Uh, treatment is not the most important, but I mean, this is something to read. Um, know what's the cause, you can use treatment like radi uh, radiation. Uh, phlebotomy, are we familiar with the phlebotomy? Yeah. There is, th there are people who are specialists in that, specialized phlebotomists, if you heard about this. Phlebotomist is dealing with the blood vessels, basically. And what they actually do here is, uh, you're having too much red blood cells, they make an opening and they make you bleed a little bit. So you lose some blood. If you come once a week, yeah, and I'm gonna make you lose some blood. If, if, if the cause is not treatable, okay? But if the cause is treatable, treat it. What if it's not treatable, what should I do now? It's bad to have too much red blood cells, yes? Do you do what? Can I not donate blood? They can, of course. They can. Yeah, this is one of, one of the solutions. Donate. If they don't have an issue in the blood itself, it's just you're producing too much. Yes, you can donate. But they usually go to the phlebotomist once a week or something, and you lose some of your blood. Okay. So if you have too much red blood cells, could you also develop jaundice? You you can because yes yes you're you're getting yeah you're breaking down more red blood cells accumulating bilirubin yes yes now blood clotting disorders. What's a blood clotting disorder? You have a problem with blood clots. You do not make, um, your blood clotting system is not efficient enough. You have a problem, either with the platelets or the clotting factors that we talked about before, okay? Something like you're having persistent treatment. I always have treatment from my gum. I, for, from my gum. I always have treatment from the nose, uh, bleeding from the nose for some reason. So you're not, you don't have enough uh, blood coagulation. Uh, epistaxis. Okay, which is blood from the nose. Pity key. If I, if I look on, on your skin, I see red spots all over your body. So this is the, the um, you're, you're not having enough or efficient coagulation system that you have this pity key, which is very tiny red spots, bleeding, a little bit of bleeding under the skin. And this is called pity key. And you can also have purpura and ecchymosis, which is close to this, but it's a bigger patches. In all cases, it's blood under the skin. You're not having enough bleeding system, and you start to lose the blood and goes under the skin. Petechi, key, purpura, and ecchymosis, and you need to remember this. Petechi, key, purpura, and ecchymosis. Petechi key is t very tiny blood. Uh, purpura is bigger and a little bit bluish. Ecchymosis is even bigger, okay? All of them are bleeding under the skin. Basically, you can bleed anywhere in the body. You can also bleed in your joints, and I call that hemarthrosis. Hemarthrosis. What's arthro means? Arthro. Joint. Hemarthrosis, he means blood. So hemarthrosis is bleeding in the joint. So the, 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 the problem is you bleed anywhere in your body, anywhere, under your skin. Pity key purpura achymosis, right? You bleed inside, you bleed in the joints, you can bleed anywhere. This is pity key, like very tiny. This is purpura, which is bigger and bluish. And this is achymosis, which just looks like bruising or something. And all three, <coughs> blood under the skin. Hematemesis versus Hemoptysis, what's the difference? And this is something that you need to know. Hematemesis versus hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is coughing, coughing with blood. You cough sputum that contain blood. Hematemesis 
is you 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 vomit blood. Okay, so it's a it's a, a ground a, um, coffee ground vomiting or emesis. You I'm I'm vomiting blood, <coughs> vomiting digested blood. Okay, and this is called hematemesis, and you need to know what's hematemesis. Okay, hematemesis is you're vomiting blood, vomiting digested blood. It's not fresh blood. You can also have blood anywhere, in the feces, in the urine, and so on. One of the types of, um, of uh, blood clotting disorders is hemophilia. And hemophilia, you're lacking vitamin uh, uh, factor 8. I didn't talk much about this, and the details are not even needed. But there is a list of factors that are needed to make the blood clot. Number 8 is deficient, and this is good enough to remember. Okay, so hemophilia A, you're lacking number eight. How about the rest from one to 12? Everything else is fine. Okay, so blood clotting factors, all of them are okay, except number eight. And this is X-linked recessive. This is something that you need to know. X-linked recessive. And usually it comes to men, but carried by women. So women pass it to men. So as usual, hematoma and hemarthrosis will be common because it's one of the uh, blood clotting deficiency problems or blood clotting problems. Okay. Now, what will happen in hemophilia? You have bleeding time and P time will be normal. PT, PTT, and APTT will be prolonged or abnormal, and you need to know the details. This, what will be normal and what will not be normal. You don't have to know the rest of the details. This is good enough to know, but you have to remember it. What is normal and what's not normal. Do you remember these tests when we talked about it before? So number eight will be detected by one of those. Bleeding time is okay. Prothrombin time is okay. But the PTT and APTT, both of them are not okay. Treatment is not the most important as usual. They can give them this repression, replace factor eight, whatever. But you have to remember that bleeding time and PT is normal. PTT and APTT is abnormal. Next disease is hemolytic, um, I mean blood clotting deficiency also, von Willebrand disease. This is, um, I think, German scientist or something that, who discovered this problem. It's also something that's very similar to uh, hemophilia A, but it's not factor eight, okay? And basically, the factor that's deficient is called von Willebrand factor. Okay? Not important the details. Just one of the blood clotting factors is deficient, which is called the von Willebrand. And obviously, you will not you will not have the, a good blood clotting. You will have bleeding everywhere, which is the same, all of them. Hemophilia. Uh, von Willebrand, all of these, you don't have enough blood clotting, so you will have these problems like purpura, petechiae, and so on. Uh, bleeding in the joint, bleeding in the intestine, bleeding in the stomach, bleeding anywhere. From the nose, hematemesis, anything. It's all the same. DIC. DIC means disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. And I'm going to summarize this. Here's what you need to know. Disseminated means all over. Intravascular inside the blood vessels, coagulation. Here is exactly what's happening. Those people will have excessive coagulation in the whole blood. The blood coagulate everywhere. And because of that, you will have a lot of blood clots and you're losing your uh, clotting factors. You exhausted all of them. Okay? Did you get the idea? Disseminated in the vascular coagulopathy. What's the problem here? The IC. What's the problem? Overall disseminated coagulation. Blood clot, blood clot, blood clot, blood clot, all over. So what's the problem now? You have too much blood clots to the extent of you lose your <coughs> clotting factors. And this is what we need to know. Okay? And this usually leads to death. Thrombophilia. What failure means? If you know failure, that will give you the clue. 
What's failure and what's phobia? Phobia is? What? Hate. I have phobia. I have phobia against mosquitoes. I have phobia against high places or something, right? Phobia. Phobia means you hate. Philia means you love. So philia and phobia are the opposite of each other. Philia and phobia. Love and hate. Philia and phobia. So thrombophilia, you have you love or you have the tendency to make more thrombi, which is the opposite of what we just mentioned. Thrombophilia. So you make too much blood clots and you can have DVT or pulmonary embolism. Deep vein thrombosis. You have thrombus in the veins. Uh, heparin can be used as an anticoagulant, and we talked about this before. Uh, myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, it's a problem with uh, production in the bone marrow. I don't think the details are not the most important. Just know that this this is a problem with uh, in the bone marrow t for production. Good enough. Leukemia. The normal number of white blood cells is about from 7 to 11, 10 or 11 thousands, okay? If you have 20, 30 thousands, what do you call this? Hmm? What do you call it? Remember the, the three that I put here? I put three here, remember? Erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes, and then I put penia and cytosis. Do you remember this? So if the, if the white blood cells increased, penia means what? Penia is less. More is? Cytosis. So what do you call it? Leukocytosis. Right? Leukocytosis. So if, if the white blood cells increased a little bit, you call that leukocytosis. Okay? 15,000, 20,000, 30,000. This is called leukocytosis. But how about 500,000? This is not leukocytosis anymore. This is leukemia. So leukemia is not just increased number of white blood cells that are sick, they have cancer, but it's actually a dramatic increase. Okay? You're talking about 300,000, five, not, not uh, 20 or 15,000 or something. This is leukocytosis, okay? So leukemia is uncontrolled production of white blood cells that's cancerous. Uncontrolled production of huge number of white blood cells that contain cancer. Cancerous white blood cells. Okay? This is a problem with leukemia. So if I count your white blood cells, it will be huge amount. But it's not even functional. It's not good. These cells contain cancer. So this is leukemia. Leukemia can be acute and can be chronic. Acute means you start to have it today, maybe next month or next two months, you have the problem. Chronic means it takes longer time to develop. Maybe it takes two or three years until the problems start to show up. Which one is more dangerous? The acute is more dangerous. Chronic is less. Okay? And we have different types. But here is the rule that I want you to know. Simple. The acute is more in younger people, the chronic is more in older people. Okay? And you can have it in any line. Lymphocytes, lymphocytic, myelocytes, uh, lymphocytic, and so on. Acute and chronic and so on. You can have it in different things, but th this is just generally speaking. So now you have too many white blood cells. Is that something good? It's bad because these are not normal white blood cells, right? These are malignant white blood cells. Are they doing the function? No. You have three, five hundred thousand white blood cells that are not functional. So do you still get infections a lot? Yes. Even though you have a huge number, but it's not working. It's bad. It's cancer, right? So you still get a lot of infection. At the same, t at the same time, you are making the bone marrow leave everything else and it's exhausting itself, overworking to make more and more and more white blood cells. So do you have the time to make the red blood cells and the thrombocytes? No. So you will have lack of all of them. You will have anemia, 
you will have thrombocytopenia, and even though you have huge number of white blood cells, but it's cancerous. Okay? Which one is worse, acute or chronic? Acute. Acute is worse. Which one is more in adult, in, uh, in older people? Chronic. chronic. And which more in younger? Acute. So acute is worse and in younger, chronic is better, milder, and in older people. And, and the difference is this goes too fast, acute goes too fast, chronic takes more time. So again, the problem is, can you, can you tell me if, if it, we're almost done? Just tell me what happened. You have huge number of white blood cells that are cancerous. Is that working? It's not working, so you end up having more infection. And you're utilizing your bone marrow to make white blood cells, right? Do you have the time to make red blood cells? So what do you have? Anemia. Anemia. You don't have the time to make red blood cells. And you don't have to make you don't have the time to make platelets either. So what do you have? Hemophilia is one of the reasons, but what's the condition itself? Hmm? No, if you don't have enough platelets, bleeding. Yes, bleeding more, right? So you have three problems: a lot of white blood cells that are working. You have more infection, less red blood cells. You don't have the time to to, to do it. Anemia. <laughs> Less platelets, more bleeding. And this is what we need to know. Diagnosis simply count and see what's wrong. Can be treated by different ways. Last thing here in this chapter is multiple myeloma. And multiple myeloma, the only thing that I want you to know about it is it is a cancer in the plasma cells. That's good enough to know. Cancer of the plasma cells. What are the plasma cells? These are the mature B cells, one of the white blood cells. It's not leukemia. Leukemia is all white blood cells. This is different. This is only in the plasma cells. And this is good enough to know in this part. It has a poor prognosis and more in older people, but the most important to know is it's a, it's a neoplasm of uh, the plasma cells, okay?